This is Lancaster, home to about 150,000 people. This city in the northwest of England is calming, convenient and cosmopolitan. It has a countryside with rolling hills, a busy town centre and a world-class university, all connected by a canal that connects city to the coast and countryside. Some of the history that defines the town is very visible. The medieval castle that looms over the city was built on the site of a former Roman river fort, and this along with the remains of a nearby Roman bathhouse highlights the truly ancient past of Lancaster's. This castle also houses the oldest sitting crown court in England, most famous obviously for the Pendlewitch Trials of 1612. On the other hand, the architectural contributions of mill owner Lord Ashton, who is best remembered by this memorial in Williamson Park, are a reminder of the industrial development here in the 19th and early 20th century, when Lancaster's main employment was in cotton and lino mills. Yet one really important part of Lancaster seems to always get less attention. That's St George's Quay and New Quay, right where I'm standing. And this is where a mixture of Georgian houses and both industrial and new housing estates are built. Like the castle and Ashton Memorial, these key sites here are very essential in the city's history and collective memory. So how might the history of the quay and of Lancaster as a port town add to our collective memory here? So one of the many attractions of these houses on the quay side is obviously the River Loon. Now this river stretches 53 miles and is also home to some good old English trout and some English salmon. I mean after all, who wouldn't like to live here? Sit on the balcony, enjoy that plate of salmon and a drink in hand. Well, that's lovely, I'd like to live here. Well, I've got to pass my A-levels first, but you get the idea. Walking along the street on the quay, I couldn't help but notice the names of some of these streets. Here's Cotton Square, Gold Lane, Africa Drive, Fetus Road and Paragon Way, to name a few. What histories of Lancaster do these streets reflect, if they mean anything at all? So St George's Quay was built in 1750, at a time when Lancaster was a really busy port town. So what were the main imports and how were these goods imported? From the 16th up to the 19th century, the transatlantic slave trade saw the enslavement of 12 million Africans shipped across the Atlantic to work as slave labour in sugar and cotton plantations in the West Indies and Americas. It is estimated that British ships carried 3.5 million of those enslaved. In the 18th century, Lancaster became heavily involved in this trade and the profits from the transatlantic slave trade combined with the profits from direct trade with slavery colonies of the West Indies, saw wealthy merchants invest in and build St George's Quay. Considering the origins and development of the quay, would any of these street names shed any insight into this part of Lancaster's history? I'm off to do some extra digging. So from this online database, which was really helpfully assembled by some independent scholars across the Atlantic world, I've got some figures. From 1747 to 1793, there were a total of 153 ships that departed from Lancaster and would go on to trade for human cargo and then sell these in slave markets like the West Indies colonies, for example, Jamaica, Barbados, etc. Now, more generally, Lancaster registered ships uh, captured and sold an estimated 30,000 people. But it's important to bear in mind that some of these ships, instead of departing from Lancaster, also departed from other ports like Liverpool. So in summary, Lancaster was the fourth largest slave trading port in the UK, after Liverpool, which dominated the trade, and Bristol and London. It is worth noting that the population of Lancaster in the mid 18th century was around 7,000 people. So amongst all these ships, some were captained by fellow Lancastrians, Thomas Hines, Robert Dobson, and John Preston, to name a few. But here's what's interesting. Take John Preston. Some of these ships that he captained 
course Minerva and Thessus happen to be the street names of the industrial estate right here. Tracing the origins of ships named Thetis and Minerva, I found something. These two ships were manufactured by a shipbuilding company. Its name, Brockbank, and the location of its shipbuilding yards on Cable Street in Lancaster. And could there be any coincidence that a few blocks away from Thetis Road and Minerva Road is a stretch right where I'm standing? called Rockbank Avenue. So this is all the evidence has led me to so far. So were these streets actually named after slave ships captained by Lancastrians? Or was it just a mere coincidence? If not, how much of Lancaster's history was actually tied to the 18th century plantation and transatlantic slavery? There's more I'd like to find out. We are a group of sixth form students at Lancaster Royal Grammar School, led by Mr. Jamie Reynolds. We work with other local history groups, including some from the Lancaster Girls Grammar School, and are part of a wider project led by Professor Imogen Taylor and Dr. Sneeta Abraham at Lancaster University, who were also part of the Lancaster Black History Group, and were kind enough to assist us with our research into street names and Lancaster's history. These street names include Africa Drive, Cotton Square, Gold Lane, Mariner Way, Braganza Way, Paragon Way, Thetis Road, Brockbank Avenue, Port Royal Avenue, Europa Way, Ceres Way and Minerva Road. We have discovered how Lancastrian slave traders and merchants developed extensive commercial networks in the West Indies and Americas, importing slave produced goods, to name a few, mahogany, sugar, dye, rice, spices, coffee, rum, and later cotton for Lancashire's mills from plantations, and exporting back fine furniture, gunpowder, woolen and cotton garments to the colonies. And we would like to share this global history of Lancaster with you. This project is entirely voluntary for our students, completely evidence-led, and purely for the purpose of deepening our understanding of local history. At the end, all we'd like to do is to best inform ourselves and the local community of the more hidden aspects of Lancaster's past.